Welcome to Health Activators with lifestyle medicine doctor, GP and longevity expert, Dr. Alka Patel. This show will help you to discover a hidden health hacking code that unlocks your phenomenal potential for an outstanding health span, lifespan and wealth span. The show features candid conversations with celebrities, influencers and industry icons, real life stories and cutting edge health activating advice that other doctors might not tell you. Discover why now is the time to join the strategic self-care revolution and experience the profound effects this will have on your personal and professional success. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alka Patel. Hi, hey, and hello, health activators. In today's show, I am joined by the incredible Gail Porter, who's been a favorite on our screens since the 90s. We talk about hair and the impact that losing her hair had on her. Hair today, gone tomorrow. We talk about depression, suicide control, and I find out how Gail moved from self-harm to self-care. I know that you're going to enjoy this whole conversation. So on my show today, I have the BAFTA award-winning TV presenter, broadcaster, charity ambassador, author, and I think Star Wars super fan as well. It's Gail Porter, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. That's really good. I like that intro. Could you do that for me every morning? Or I'll just say, oh, like, yeah. I'll record it and I'll just play it every morning and I'll go, yes. So then if I have a bad morning, I'll go, I'll have that. I forget about <laughs> things like that because, you know, people, I don't know. Well, I know that I was super fan of Star Wars, so that's great. But everything else, I go, oh, yeah, do that. Yesterday I was doing a speech. And then they introduced me, they were introducing all these lovely, wonderful influencer people. And then they got to me and they went, and then it's Gail Porter. Well, Gail's just Gail. I was like, okay. <laughs> I didn't get any of that sort of lovely stuff that you've just done. They were just like, oh, you know, Gail, it's just Gail. <laughs> well, it may be a bit, Gail, because you don't need any introduction, right? Because you are this super household name. You've shot to stardom. You've got your celebrity status from the 90s. And just, you just that's the intro. It's Gail Porter. So look, Gail, I guess it's pretty uh, pretty fair to say your life's had its fair share of ups and downs or maybe unfair share of ups and downs, hasn't it? I think uh, in terms of, as you say, what do people know Gail for? It's lighting up the Houses of Parliament. You've been through divorce. You've had sudden onset of alopecia, all of this whilst you were in America filming your TV series. So I guess the, the question that I'd love to ask you is, how has all this roller coaster of life really affected your your health over these years? Well, to be honest, it's not until I hear it all packed in together that I think, yeah, that was actually quite a lot. But loads of people go through stuff um, every single day, as we know. But I think I think the the divorce was not easy. I mean, it's never easy. I think this, you know, it's just not pleasant. And um, that was unfortunate. Um, the hair loss was very traumatic because it was so unexpected. Um, you know, I was working in America looking for, I was doing a program called Dead Famous. We were looking for dead, fa dead famous people. Even now I laugh thinking I was doing what? Um, and then I remember when my hair started falling out, it was like one clump here, one clump there. Within three and a half, four weeks, nothing whatsoever. And I had very little hair and then suddenly it's all gone. And um, so I think that was something that really, really upset me because my daughter was at home with her dad. Uh, in London and I was in America and so I'd left my tiny daughter who was I think two at the time with loads of hair gone to work and I had to phone home and say mummy's coming back completely bald and my ex was just saying well that's ridiculous and I said well it's not something I'm going to make up is it I said all my hair is just falling out it's just all falling out and uh, my daughter's going to see mummy go away um you know hairy and then come back with absolutely nothing. So um, the flight home was awful. I was overthinking everything, just thinking, oh my gosh, what if she doesn't accept me, doesn't recognize me? And yeah, I got home, I cried the whole way home, I think. Poor, poor staff on the airline dealing with me the whole way. <laughs> I got lots of hugs and stuff, because we were allowed hugs then. I mean, we're allowed hugs now, but you know. Um, but um, yeah, but then when I got home, she just said, rock and roll. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, that was it. it was that simple. There was no yeah. questions, no nothing. Yeah. And I thought, well, do you know what? 
you know, children are the best. They are actually, we know that. Children and animals are the best. And uh, she just accepted it as it was. Mm. I mean, I saw a little boy the other day and he was pointing at my hair and he just went, where's it gone? Yeah. And I went, oh, on the bus. And he went, oh, okay. It, so is he, that, he thinks I've worked on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> and it is that sort of almost childlike curiosity, isn't it? That sometimes we kind of need that for, for ourselves because all of Absolutely. that overthinking you did on that plane back, you created your own anxiety in a world that didn't even exist. You kind of, we love our minds, right? We love our imagination and our creativity, but you just created this, this world that wasn't even real because of what you thought might or might not be. And we live there, don't we? In terms of kind of worry and anxiety, we're very good at creating our own, our own inner world that doesn't really exist. And as you say, the real thing is your daughter just was like, hey, mum. Yeah, mine. Yeah, our, you're completely right. Our imaginations are wonderful. That Ziggy, that Ziggy Stardust in the background there. She lo- she loves to come into a bit of her. You right there? Oh, she's yeah. quite cool. So. Um, but uh, yeah, it, we're, we're all very good at thinking negatively. And, you know, I try my hardest to think positively about everything. And mm-hmm. that can be quite tricky when I live in London. But like you say, it's not good for your health. So when I get up in the morning, I think, A, I'm going to play you saying that introduction to me every morning. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but yeah, you have to get up and think. Even because I suffered from, um, I get quite anxious. I suffer from depression, which I've talked about quite a lot. And you know, I know losing your hair is not a silly thing, but in the in the whole scheme of things, it's not that bad. You know, mm-hmm. I just embraced it and got on with it. And I actually probably made myself more ill by worrying than actually just losing my hair. Mm-hmm. So it was more of the stress of thinking, oh, can I go out? Are people going to make fun of me? Is my mm. daughter going to love me? Um, do I have to stay in forever? Does that mean I'm going to be cat lady? Oh, yes, I am. Mm. <laughs> I'll take the last bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just um, it's my own, my, own, my, my own head that makes me unwell sometimes yeah. because I'm overthinking and thinking negatively when I should be thinking, cool. do you know what, I've got this, but mm. you can't have it every single day. No, no, and you're right. Really and it's good. And interestingly, I was talking to my hairdresser recently about about hair, as you do to your hairdresser. And uh, she said that about about (laughs) 70 to 80 percent of people who sit in her chair worry about hair loss or are experiencing hair loss. So I think that's a really important point that you're raising, um, Gail, and and so grateful that you're bringing this into, into the limelight is, yes, it's important. Yes, it feels like it's part of your identity and creates that level of confidence for you but look deeper than that right well I had um I was at a lunch thing the other day there and it was a couple of people I knew a lot of people I didn't know you know you're very polite you do your thing and then um one of the guys just suddenly went he was chatting about me while I was next to him Mm. and he said oh um, he was speaking to an American couple and he went, oh, this is Gail Porter. Oh, my God, you should have seen her when she'd, she had hair. She was so pretty. And I was just like, do you know what? You can say that in your own mind. You don't have to say it out loud to a table of 10 people when I only know two of you. And mm-hmm. as, if, as if, you know, she's got no hair, so she's, nah, she's mm-hmm. nothing now. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? My mum lost her hair through chemotherapy. Don't ever don't ever see things like that because you don't know what people are going through and you know if you think I don't look great then that's fine I mean I didn't think I looked great with hair or without hair it doesn't matter but don't see things like that out loud it's just very rude because people can get very upset and hurt by those things you know mm-hmm. so I just thought that's a rubbish thing to say so I, I kept my dignity and I got up and I made my excuses and left because of the Scottish person inside me wanted to go right outside but no I didn't I would do that but in my mind, it is. But I kept that to myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you had a tough time, didn't you? I mean, you mentioned depression. That that hit hard, didn't it? So sounds like sounds like Gale of today is a very different Gale to a couple of decades ago. What was it really like at that time? Well, um, I always find it a bit weird to talk about. Yeah, it's not weird. It's just hard, I think. But um, there was a time so divorced, lost my hair. Hardly got any work because I look different and it all changed. And um, the only the only things people wanted me to talk about was hair loss or depression. Mm-hmm. Because I've talked about depression since day one, because uh, I've had it since I was a teenager. So, you know, up, down. I did a documentary, the, the, the documentary you were talking about called Being Gil Porter. And I actually saw five doctors 
for about five, 10 minutes each while we were filming around the country and I got five different diagnoses. They didn't even know me. And I thought that was really interesting. So I was bipolar one, bipolar two, manically depressed, depressed, totally fine. (laughs) I don't know these people. So it was just so bizarre seeing all these different responses to what they thought I had. Mm. And so it's not putting anyone off going to doctors because obviously doctors are great and wonderful. But for me, when it comes to mental health, you have to give me more than five minutes. And I understand that mental health and um, with the NHS, I know it's extremely difficult. I know that the funding is terrible. And, um, it's you know, mental health is it's not like you've got a broken arm or it's not like you've got mm-hmm. a tummy upset. It's not something you can just go, do you know what, we'll give you that, you'll be fine. It's just ongoing. So that's the, the good thing about talking to people and doing these sort of things, that, you know, you, you've got a platform. I love my Instagram and I love my Twitter and people say, oh, do you know what? You know, social media can be a really dangerous place. Mm-hmm. Well, do you know what? If somebody's horrible to you on it, you just block. It's really simple. And if somebody reaches out to you, you've done something good. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, back to the depression stuff. So, <laughs> um, so what happened yet? So the work kind of dried up, couldn't afford my rent. Um, so lost my flat and then I was homeless. And then, um, Obviously, homeless is not great. Um, Mm. So I was kind of, I stayed on a few people's sofas every now and then, but then I got so embarrassed because I thought at my age, I'd done okay, I'd been okay, it'd all been fine. And then suddenly I've got one black sack of clothes because I put everything in storage and I couldn't afford to get it out. So they sold all my stuff. (laughs) So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm actually genuinely starting from the beginning. So I thought either this is going to break me or it's going to make me. So it broke me for a bit. So I had a complete breakdown and I phoned an ex of mine and asked if um, I could get some help. I said, you know, I've been to the doctors. They said, you know, what are you doing four weeks on Tuesday or four weeks on Thursday? I was like, no, it's now. I need help now. And then eventually some police officers turned up and said, oh, we've heard that um, you're you're not feeling great. And I was like, well, what's the police got to do with this? Well, just in case you hurt yourself. And then they took me into um, a hospital and I sat there in a room for 12 hours. Mm. And then I started kicking off, you know. <laughs> I just wanted to go home. Or, well, there was no home to go to. I just wanted to go anywhere. And then um, eventually two doctors came in and they saw me again for about five minutes. And they said, oh, we need, we, we think we, should, we need to put you into a section home place. Mm. And I was like, no, I don't want to go there. I just want someone to talk to. And um, he said, well, we need your mum or dad to sign this form off. And I said, well, my mum's dead and my dad lives in Spain. So so they signed it. And then they said, you're sectioned for 28 days. Wow. And um, and I never saw a doctor at all when I was locked up. I was just locked up with another bunch of people for all different reasons. So, you know, there's one guy that I'm completely, I've kept in touch with. He's an amazing artist, wonderful, lovely guy. Um, there was a guy that was in, he was waiting to go to prison, but the prisons were full because he'd, um, it was an attempted murder. It was just like, it was literally like one flew over a cookie's nest. Mm-hmm. And then eventually the doctors came in after, I don't know if it was 12, 13, 14 days, don't know, came in, sat me down and said, we're really sorry, you shouldn't have been in here. And they let me go with a bag full of medication because they'd medicated me all day, every day. And then right. that was it. <laughs> Let's just pause that because this, this you, can't morning, make up. Okay? <laughs> you can't make this up I mean this for me the word negligence keeps coming up that's the one word that I'm hearing as you're as you're saying this because this isn't care this is not health care there was no care there was no, no care no it was just getting you off the street it's like oh well we don't know how to deal with that and so uh, but that place has been closed down unsurprisingly um and I understand that it's um it's a difficult situation to deal with, but don't lock people up. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I was just sitting there thinking, I've got no idea what I'm doing here. And then I was not going to take any medication, but they said you have to because mm. you're in here and you can't get out. So eventually I was just taking, you know, whatever they gave me. I actually wrote a list of it when I got home and I, I was just showed it to my friend who's a, a doctor. And she was just like, you were taking all that in one day? And I was like, yeah, every day. That's what they gave us. And what what did make the difference? Because it wasn't going to be the medication. It wasn't going to be no. locked up, as you put it. It wasn't going to be seeing your GP for 10 minutes and getting 
a label which doesn't even mean anything. And I and I think we label too easily. And I have to call that out really because labeling, giving you a diagnosis, it's you know it's, it's a d- double edged sword. You, it can either help you because it helps you understand yourself. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it does totally the opposite, and you just get cast with this diagnostic label that doesn't help you at all. And it sounds in your case as though that wasn't nothing that you've described so far was what was helpful. What was it? What did make the difference for you? Well, firstly, I totally agree with you because you have to say something. If someone comes in to see you and asks you about these things, you know, sometimes a label is great for someone because you think, right, okay, actually, do you know what I've got? That symptom, this symptom, that that makes sense to me. It was me getting so many different labels. It was making me worse because I was thinking, am I terrible? Am I a, a bad human? Um, is there something like really wrong with me? But um, what made me better? Okay, so when I got back home, it was a bit, you know, I was very nervous about being home. I was very anxious. My phone was being hacked at the time. So there was, you know, stuff about me being sectioned in the papers and I didn't, I didn't know if it was a friend that had done it. I didn't know. So that was not good for my mental health mm-hmm. either. And then it wasn't until a lot later that I found out that people were listening to my phone calls. And yeah. Anyway, so that was not great. But then um, I was thinking, right, this is terrible. I've got no money. I've got no nothing. And then, you know, that weird program, Big Brother, they contacted me. And I think, do you know what? They do kind of prey on the vulnerable or people that are, you know, they're going to make you tell you because you think we don't know what's going to happen with this one. Mm-hmm. So they said, Could you, do you want to do it? And of course, I was like, no. But yes, because I need some money to get me back on my feet again. And I thought, right, I've been sectioned. I can handle a big brother house. Tell you what, I'd rather be sectioned again. <laughs> wow. <Okay. laughs> but, you know, it got me on my feet and it was um, very intense. I think it was kind of a bit of a weird thing to do right after being sectioned. So you're in a whole place with people you don't know. And then you're going into another place with people you don't know, but you're getting filmed at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And then when I came out of that and I had enough money, I mean... They didn't pay great, but they gave me enough money to put a deposit on a rented flat. And when I came out of that and I thought, you know what, I've done I've done both of these things. I've got this now and I'm not going to let anyone put me down. You can say what you want. And when I came out of Big Brother, the, everyone that worked on it was lovely. And they said, do you want to, do you want to see any of the episodes? I was like, no, I've just lived it. I don't mm. care how you've edited it. I don't care. They went, do you want to see the press cuttings? No, I don't care what people think of me. I've done it. I've done my job, I've got a roof over my head and now that's it, onwards and upwards and I'm going to start talking about what I went through which I didn't want to talk about before because I felt embarrassed and ashamed Mm. and and I thought yeah I'm going to start doing this and then things started happening and then the documentary BBC contacted me and they said you want to do a documentary about what's happened to you and I thought oh gosh no but then I thought yes I do actually yeah let's see and it was really hard to film. Well, why, did, why did you do it? What was it? What's that? What was that driving force behind? I'm going to lay myself bare. I know your book's called Laid Bare as well, isn't it? What? Why did you do that? I think it was because when it all started happening to me, I thought I was the only person that ever gone through this, and I didn't speak to anybody because I was ashamed. I didn't speak to anybody because I was, you know, embarrassed. And then when I did attempt to try and see a doctor, they were too busy, or and I was just which I understand completely wholeheartedly, but then I started feeling more and more, you know, of an outcast. And then once I went through the sectioning, then I went through the Big Brother thing and I thought, right, it's just like from one thing, one minute I'm being sectioned for being whatever, I, you know, I don't know what the correct term is to to use when you're not feeling quite right in the head. And then the next minute I'm getting filmed and people Mm. are watching and either laughing at you because you're not quite right. So it just starts like that. And then I thought, no, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this now. That's it. I'm done. So when the documentary, they came to me and I just thought, ideally, no. And then I thought, yeah, do you know what? This could help a lot of people, you know. A lot of people might be sitting at home like I used to do on my own thinking, I'm on my own here. And then the amount of people that have contacted me since I did the film that said, oh, my gosh, I felt like that. Oh, my gosh, I did that. Yeah. And so, you know, even if it made difference to one person, then I was happy, but it seemed to make a difference to quite a lot. Oh, I think it did. I think it's made a difference to more than quite a lot for sure, because I think it's it's taken some of this, that the whole mental health approach out of the doctor's surgery because yeah. it doesn't belong there. Those conversations exactly. don't belong there. Unfortunately, the doctor's surgery is set up to try and fix you as quickly as possible, which means here's your here's your packet of pills and off you go. And I, and I say this very crassly, but 
that's genuinely how it's set up because there isn't space for anything more. But it needs more. It needs connection. It needs community. It but needs an opportunity it's to it's share. Doctor, yeah, it's not doctor's fault. It's like, absolutely. You know, you know, we need, you need you need finance. You need somewhere to yes. go and talk to people. You need the time. You need you know. Not, at the moment, everyone's struggling. We're all struggling. We don't know what's going on at the moment. So it's trying to find places. You know, I'd love to do a talk once a week somewhere, but mm-hmm. if I get a job, I have to go because yes. I'm freelance. And a lot of people are the same. You know, we can't just go. Do you know what? Every Wednesday I'll be there. I can't say that. You know. Yeah. No. Look. I mean, there's so many interesting points to to talk about. I guess it's. What do you, what do you say to your daughter, Gail? What do you say to, to Honey? She's you know special woman in in your life. What do you? What's the message for her? Well, Honey and I have talked about it ever since she was old enough to understand what was going on. So for her, I don't think she thinks it's kind of an issue. She just thinks you know she thinks. Well, I'm just her mum, but she knows about you know um, mental health issues. But she's very confident, very good at everything. But she knows that, I will say to her, you need to talk, you call me at any time. Anything upsets you, you call me at any time. Mm-hmm. You know, she's at uni now, and um, I worry about that. But um, now, I mean, I just say to her, talk. Yeah. You know, like I say to her friends, talk to anybody. We're well, not strangers in the street, but um, that's that's what your mum does. But uh, <laughs> no, just, just if anything bothers you, there's nothing to be embarrassed about ever. Yeah. In, yeah. You know, she's at that age now. She's like, yeah, whatever. But yeah, but she knows that I've got her back, and she's gone through seeing the, the struggles that I've gone through, mm-hmm. and I apologise a lot to her. I'm like, I'm so sorry that that happened, and she's like, it's fine, it's not fine, because she's had to grow up differently from other kids. You know, mum's been sectioned, mum's not been well, mum's been homeless. Um, but mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's also made her a very strong little human yeah. being. Yeah, and, there's uh, a yeah. And the fact we've just been very honest. So who's got your back then, Gail? Who's in who's in your phone book on speed dial that you talk to? Uh, well, I talk to the cat a lot, which is quite good because she doesn't answer back. <laughs> but now I've got friends. Um, I don't really like to burden people too much. And at the moment, I'm really happy. But I do know that I've got a good handful of friends that if the worst comes to worst, if I phone them at two o'clock in the morning, they would they would answer um but luckily touch wood I don't need to do that at the moment yeah. I mean I have my days when I wish I could phone my mom and my dad or my grandma and my grandpa and um I don't have them anymore so that kind of hurts sometimes mm-hmm. but um I will try and phone my daughter but if she picks up that's 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 amazing <laughs> she's too busy, <laughs> too busy. Yeah. You know, you're gonna be busy when you're 20 but no, I've got great friends. So I know the people that I can phone if I'm feeling a bit down yeah. that won't judge me and they'll just listen. And they and vice versa, they know they can call me anytime too. Mm. So if the phone goes at 11 o'clock, I always take my phone to bed with me. Well, I'll leave it beside me on vibrate just in case. Because I had a friend, unfortunately, who um, committed suicide a long, long time ago. And I didn't have my phone with me. And um, she had tried to phone me earlier in the evening but I was asleep. Not, I don't know if it would have made any difference or not, but it's never left my head just thinking, mm. oh my gosh. You know, I, yeah, don't know. It's just one of those things I think about quite a lot, thinking, oh, I should have had my phone, but I don't think it would have made any difference at all. Yeah. Yeah. I just like knowing it's there. And also when you've got a 20-year-old, you know, you've got a teenager. When you've got children, you need to have the phone beside the bed just in case. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And that's hard, isn't it, to carry that thought that, could I have done something different for my friend at, at yeah. that point? And it's it's that responsibility you carry, but it's not your responsibility. You know logically that that yeah. isn't that isn't your responsibility. I guess kind of back to you. I know you've talked about harm and self harm as well before. Did you ever feel like that in terms of the harm moving to a place of taking your life? No, I mean I. I once took an accidental overdose and that genuinely was an accidental overdose I was exhausted and I was hadn't slept for days and I kept just taking and I had headaches and I was just crying so much and I took a few painkillers and then I'd been given is it cocodamol or something like that from the doctors and then I was taking that on top of something else and then suddenly I thought oh my gosh I'm not right so I actually phoned my ex-husband and I said I think I've mixed up these pills and I shouldn't have done it because if I wanted to do anything to see it I would never want to do anything like that 
But I phoned him out. I said, I think I've genuinely made a mistake. So he was like, okay, fine, get to the hospital. And we were fine. It was all good. So, uh, but of course, my phone was being hacked at the time. So suddenly it was in the paper as Gail Porter tries to kill herself. I was like, no, I just mixed up tablets, my fault. And then they made it to a sensational story, which was mm-hmm. upsetting because, yeah. But no, self-harm was a thing that I started when I was a teenager. I don't know where it came from. Um, I've tried to look into it a bit more about why. I think it was just, I didn't like myself very much. And mm-hmm. it, it was kind of a release and it sounds so stupid now. And, you know, I still got my scars on my arms. And sometimes I look at them and I think, what an idiot. But then sometimes I look at them and I thought, well, thank goodness you got over all that mad. Well, I can't say madness, can you? But, but that, that sort of whatever was going on in my head. I don't really understand it. I don't know why I did it. And um, but it just gave me some sort of weird sense of relief. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Don't do, it. don't do it now, obviously. I'm, uh, I'm very happy with everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And self-harm, there's depth to that, isn't there? And I, I think, you know, I've also sort of that thinking that we're all harming ourselves in, in some way or another, in some format of another, because we're not prioritizing taking care of ourselves. So self-harm yeah. can appear in many guises. Yours appeared in the form of, of cutting, but it can appear in terms of neglecting how you eat and having that extra cream cake when you don't need it or neglecting how you sleep and getting on Netflix and social media all night, right? This is all harm, isn't it? And it is that that call, isn't it, really, that we do need to reach out for a different level of help and a different level of responsibility as well, taking that 100% responsibility for what you do, what, even if it feels so hard, is so important. Yeah, because I did the, the same with the food thing. So I'd either not eat or then overeat. It was kind of like control because I felt like my life was out of control and I wasn't sure what I was supposed to be doing, what I was going to study, didn't know where I was going. Um, had no idea about anything. So I thought, right, I would just control eating, hurt myself every now and then because actually hurting myself was better than what was going on around me. Because uh, And also I was in control of that and the eating thing, I was in control of that. Uh, but I wasn't really. I was just, yeah, I don't know what I was doing. Mm. I thought I was in control, but I wasn't really. Mm. So what is it now for you? If it's not control, what's what pushes you forward? As you say you're in this, you feel as though you're in a, a happier place, you're in a different place. What's your motivator? We often talk about purpose, don't we, and what we value and what has meaning in life. What is it for you? Uh, my daughter. So... Um, the fact that I did all these crazy things when she was younger, I don't even know if I'm allowed to use the word crazy, strange things, um, you know, with this woke world, I'm never sure what I can and can't say. But um, when, when I did all those things when my daughter was little and I was losing control and I'd lost my house and everything, I was so ashamed of myself. Mm-hmm. And I shouldn't have been. I just was in a really bad place and I couldn't seem to get myself out of it. So now she's managed to work through all this She's such a strong human being. She's at university. She's studying really hard. I'm so proud of her. So every day I just get up and she just makes my world a better place. Even if she doesn't phone me until like on a Thursday once a week. Not that I'm like getting annoyed with her. But um, yeah, no, I'm just, I, she just makes me happy. And also when I do talks all over the place, around the country, and I will say if anyone wants a hug at the end, feel free and I get lots of other people coming up and give me a hug and I was like oh that's so nice um and chatting to me about all sorts of different things and so that gives me a sense of you know I do a lot of them for free I just as long as I make enough money doing something to keep a roof over my head I'm happy and I'm happy to do talks for you know if it's a charity of course you do it for free um if it's some you know a tiny tiny business that I've got no money or they're really struggling of course, you'll do it for free. If, if there's like lots of people and they need your help, awesome. not that I'm a therapist or anything, but sometimes it's nice to hear just your normal next door neighbor just chatting to you going, well, this happened, right? And they'll go, ah. yeah, so that keeps me going. It really does. And, you know, the fact I've got a roof over my head keeps me going, oh. which is, I think you have to, well, for me personally, hitting the lowest of the low made me look at life through a whole different set of eyes because I never in a million years thought I would be sleeping on a bench in Hampstead Heath with one bag and everything else is gone. And Mm. um, yeah, so um, every day is a blessing, really, even if I feel grumpy. 
Yeah, so charity work, you mentioned uh, working for charities. I know you're an ambassador of, of charities as well, and you've done some work with the Samaritans as well. Tell me about your, your work in the charity space. Well, yeah, ambassador for the Samaritans, ambassador for the Scottish Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Um, I work with the, well, I used to work with the Little Princess Trust, which gives wigs to children who have lost their hair through alopecia or chemotherapy. Um, and I work with the, the guide dogs. Um, I've actually just got a guide dog named Gail. They named a guide, sorry, they named a guide dog Gail. That's quite difficult to say. But yes, so I've got my own little guide dog running around, getting trained at the moment called Gail. So that was a really lovely thing. That's better than getting paid, isn't it? And um, yeah, do you know what? Anyone that asks for anything, whether it's a local charity or if I've got time and I can do you know, a Zoom or turn up at something or donate something, you know, if they've got a raffle or something, I'll do anything or just spread the word. Samaritans is amazing because when a lot of people speak to me on social media, I'm not feeling great or mm. da, 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 what do I do? I can't help you. And I don't, I mean, I can just say, right, speak to Samaritans, honestly, believe you me. I speak to them so many times uh, before I became an ambassador because they don't judge you. They don't ask your name. They don't ask anything. So you're speaking to a complete stranger and you can tell them, whatever you want and they're not going to judge you and they'll give you the best possible advice so I was honoured when they asked me to be an ambassador for them oh. and um, Changing Faces I'm going to speak to them in about half an hour Changing Faces is a charity that um, well basically it is what it is it's um, is what it says sorry it's about people that look different so whether um, it's a birth deformity it's um, burns it's me having alopecia we look different we're changing faces, we're just having, we're just being positive and giving each other, you know, just being there for each other to say, do you know what, it's good, it's good, we're different, it's all right, we're all good here. Wow, I'm just so humbled by hearing all the incredible work that you're okay. doing. And you do loads of great work, everyone does stuff, just, we just don't know it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sometimes worth having a bit of reflective space about because we think about all the things we want to do, but we don't pause to think about what I have done and also who I am as well. You know, the whole idea of I'm a human being, not just a human doing. So who am I being when I turn up as Gail Porter? Who is Gail Porter? And I, it's so great to just hear that through all your pain has come this journey that's taking you to this place where your contribution is is huge to people who really need to hear what you've been gone going through in order to make sense of their own lives because there's no doubt is there that life is full of challenges the love comes with with the pain the the grief comes because of what you gain in life you have to have both sides of the coin in in life and face those and that's exactly what you've done accepted the hard times and now you're in a space where that becomes your your contribution back to the world so really honestly genuinely feel totally humbled by what you've just um, pushed through and are doing right now you've had an amazing amazing career well do you know i think it, a lot of people don't realize how much they do for other people without actually knowing that they're doing it so you know us having this chat you've made me feel good this morning because i was really tired and then you were so lovely and i thought yeah i'm good now i'm okay and then you know neighbors i gave my little, the little one across the road i always give him a wave i got him some stuff for halloween you know, it's just something you do. You pick something up at a supermarket and hand it over or the lady downstairs will drop in. I know she likes bananas. So I'll drop in bananas. Yeah. Just tiny things. You think, well, that doesn't mean anything. And then I'll get a little note going, oh, that was so nice. Thanks. And you think, do you know what? We can all do that. Yeah. Tiny wee things make a difference. Amazing. I love that. I love that. Yeah, it's the small things and you've got to notice them, right? Just recognise yeah. that you as well. say it in Scottish, tiny wee things. <laughs> tiny wee things. How's yeah. that? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. You got it. I got it. A little bit more practice and I'm there. Amazing. Yeah, so good. I was very impressed. I'm not usually impressed by people's Scottish accents, but that was good. <laughs> love it, love it. So um look, yeah, let's try and wrap this up. We could keep talking okay. and talking, couldn't we? So I guess it's that connection between health and success in life. What's your message for people in terms of I want a successful, happy life? What do I do to take care of my health in order to achieve that? Well, to take care of your health, mentally, I would say, you know, you're going to have to take a few knockdowns. Everyone takes knockdowns. Don't take it personally. Just get up again. It might be a bit rubbish at the time, but you just keep getting up again. 
Um, for me as well, I need to get outside, even if it's pouring with rain and if I've not got any work on or anything and I think I want to stay in bed, I can't stay in bed because then I'll think too much. And then sometimes I'll, it'll be happy and then it can go to, oh, I'm not good enough or I'm not this enough or should be doing this or I should have done that. So I am out, even if it's just a walk to the park or a walk around the block or a run to the park or go and offer to walk my friend's dog. Um, yeah, anything. Doesn't matter. Just get up, get out and think, OK, we've got a bad day. But if you're having, a, you know, if you really need a rest, put on a really funny movie. Don't put on something really depressing, <laughs> which I used to do. It's like, you know, sometimes when you're feeling really sad or slightly heartbroken, you put on sad songs. Why? It's not going to help. <laughs> not going to help in the slightest. Or you put on a really depressing movie or like love story and you start crying. You say, That's not helping. Put on Anchorman. Because it's, <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> you heard it here folks Gail's favourite yeah. funny movie is Anchorman <laughs> or Eurovision yeah yeah ding dong so um, anything <laughs> anything that's daft and funny so yeah just take the knocks but take the knocks but don't let the knocks take you just take them go right thanks very much I'll pick myself back up and I'm on it again if I can do it my gosh I was on a bench what seven years ago eight years ago yeah 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 Powerful. That's a really powerful message to leave people with, Gail. Take the knocks, but don't let the knocks take you. Yes. I'm going to get a T-shirt made with that one. Eh? I'm going to send it to you. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's wear that. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> thank you so much, Gail. I really, really valued our conversation today. Right, thank you so much for asking me. It's lovely. To, hopefully, I'll meet you in real life soon. Yeah, yeah, I would love that. Absolutely. Let's do. It. Let's walk around London with our t-shirts. Yeah, I'll walk around Scotland, going just oh. a wee t-shirt, just a wee t-shirt. Right, I'll get you a kilt. Oh, brilliant! That'd be great fun. <laughs> I've got two. You can have one of mine if you want. Love yeah. it. T-shirt yeah. and no, I'm in. <laughs> Let's just go and bring happiness to Scotland, and then we'll come back to England. We'll give it to all of you. Do it. Right. Do it. Okay. Let's yeah. do it. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much, girl. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. wow, what, what a, a conversation. conversation. That phrase, take the knocks, but don't let the knocks take you. That is so powerful. I'm, I'm going to wear that T-shirt. So if anyone wants one, just, just let me know. Look, I know a lot came up in that conversation with Gail and what she shared with us about her health and her hardship. So I do want to say that if you have been affected by any issues raised in this episode, please, please do reach out to me for support or for information. And you know how to reach me just through my website, dralkapatel.com or through my socials at UK. OK, so let's get back to hair loss, alopecia. Now, the word alopecia comes from the Latin word that means bald. And there's several types of alopecia, some of which are very hormone driven, like the male pattern balding from the temples and the crown that we see, or the female pattern balding, where women tend to go much thinner on top. And some forms of alopecia, they're autoimmune driven. So what does this mean? Well, it's where your body just, it just puts up a fight against itself, which then results in having patches of hair loss called alopecia areata. Areata is the Latin word for patch. So with Gail, with Gail, she experienced a form of alopecia which started as patches and then very, very quickly became total hair loss. And what I want to reassure you about is that most forms of hair loss do regrow if, if you focus on the right triggers. And what I will share with you as well is that I myself struggled with significant alopecia areata about, about a decade ago. So I completely understand how terrifying it can feel to lose hair and the impact that it can have on your identity and your confidence. And for me, well, my hair loss followed a period of intense burnout and what I remember really vividly is I remember keeping a bowl, a bowl on the edge of the bathroom sink so that I could collect bowlfuls of hair every single morning. I was just pulling them out very, very easily, a whole bowl full of hair every single morning. But I knew that my hair would grow back because I understood its triggers. And my hair, of course, as you can see, did come back. But unlike Gail, who didn't cover up her hair loss, I did. I tried to cover up my hair loss. I tried wearing headscarves and hats. And 
I guess, of course, as a GP at that time, I was seeing, what, 40, 50 patients a day. That's 50 people who all had something to say about my hair every day. Trust me, everyone had a comment to make. There really wasn't any hiding. It wasn't, it wasn't an easy time. But look, as I said, there are so many, so many reasons for hair loss. So you have to find your trigger. So just click into the next episode for my hair hacks and I will see you over there to unlock your health activation code. Wishing you a health activating day.